talk a little bit about generation skipping transactions because I'm not sure that everybody is sort of fully familiar with that. Yeah, and let's overlay that with a, a little bit of a conversation about grantor trusts because those are kind of the powerful things that sort of get confused sometimes. And complicated. Very complicated. A generation skipping trust is a trust that will not only not be subject to estate taxes in the estate of the person that makes the transfers, it wouldn't be subject to estate tax even at the child level. So I as a grantor can make a gift of $5,120,000 of assets today, $10,240,000 if I'm married, into a trust. And it can be for a trust for the benefit of children and grandchildren. So this exemption that I get to allocate is allocated both for estate gift purposes and generation skipping purposes. Because the government is generally looking to have an estate tax paid once in each generation as we transfer assets down. But they give you the ability to sort of freeze this value for estate and generation skipping purposes if you allocate this exemption to it. Um, so the advantage of using that kind of trust is if I make transfers there and the assets grow and grow and grow, these assets will not only grow for the benefit of my children if I put them in trust, but they eventually, at the end of the day, when my kids pass away and the assets go to my grandchildren, they won't be subject to estate taxes at the child level. Very, very powerful. You know, you could, you could make transfers in some of the planning opportunities that we're speaking about, and assets, you know, can continue to grow estate and gift tax-free for 10, 20, maybe even 50 years. It's an amazingly powerful tool we take advantage of that today. And that's why it's so compelling to think about using this 5,120,000 exemption because, in effect, by doing that, you can leverage the ability to get assets over to children and grandchildren at very, very low, if any, estate and gift tax costs. The grantor trust concept is sort of a good companion piece to that because what that does is there's a funny inconsistency in the law. You can make a completed transfer for estate and gift tax purposes, but it will not be com considered a completed transfer for income tax purposes. So that you could have a situation where I make a transfer to a trust, and by putting in a provision that sort of disqualifies it from being a completed gift for income tax purposes, what ends up happening is if I do a sale to that trust, for example, there's no gain recognition currently because it's considered as if I didn't transfer it for income tax purposes. In addition to that, because it's considered a grantor trust, it means that even though I've transferred the assets into this trust, I as the donor continue to pay the income taxes on the income growing in the trust. So in effect, the income, the, the, the assets in the, in the trust grow income tax-free, which is extremely powerful if you consider that you can do this for a period of 10, 20, 50, or more years. So these kinds of things are, are, are items that are available to us, you know, planning strategies. And the grantor trust, by the way, was also one of the things that was looked to be kicked out in the president's budgetary proposal. So they are looking to attack everything. I have no idea if any of this stuff is going to get passed, but the fact that it's being discussed and there's a possibility that these things could be, could be knocked out makes it very important to try to lock in on anything that you want to do today. Because they knock out any of these things and the ability to transfer lots and lots of assets very tax efficiently, you know, could be eliminated. So Scott, all that stuff sounds really great. But let's say I'm the client for a second and I do all this stuff and I create a grantor trust and I make a gift to it and I sell it some other assets, I take back a note. I'm paying the tax on all the things that are in that trust. Right but I'm not necessarily getting the cash flow. Right. So let's say time goes by and I didn't budget quite as well as I thought I could have budgeted and now this tax is really costing me a lot of money and starting to impinge on my lifestyle. Right. Can I have the right to get some of that money back from the trust? Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that. One of the keys when you draft these trust documents is to provide as much flexibility as possible. So you can put a provision in the trust that says, you know, at the appropriate time, you know, if the trustee wants to, he can in effect turn off the spigot and, you know, that the ability to have it be a grantor trust can then be turned off. So there is flexibility. There's also ability under state law, which you'd have to look at what state these trusts are created, to get reimbursed for some of the taxes that you pay. So there is ability to have some kind of a flexibility, but an important point with these trusts is that you want to be mindful of that and make sure you put this flexibility into the agreement to the extent you can. Mm -hmm.